All right, so my name is Charlie Lineweaver. I'm talking to you. It's a beautiful morning here in Canberra, Australia. Uh, that's the capital of Australia, and the sun has just come up. It's 10 o'clock in the morning, and uh, in the background here, you can see the Lena River Delta. It's one of the, uh, it's a river in, uh, in Russia that goes north, and uh, it looks to me like a living organism, so I like to put it in the back. It looks like some kind of cells or in your lungs or your kidney or something, so that's a background that I use on some of my publications. Anyway, today I'm going to talk about, uh, I guess, are we living inside of an alien? Or, or guess, I guess the idea is, can there be different sizes to aliens? And what does size have to do with the way we understand the universe and uh, aliens in particular? So I uh, do research in astrobiology, and sometimes I say I'm looking for aliens, and that is partially true, but we're also looking to try to figure out if there are other planets like the Earth. And uh, we found thousands and thousands of other planets around other stars. They're called exoplanets. And right now, and probably during your lifetime, we have a good chance of trying to figure out if some of those planets have life on them. And we're going to do that by looking at the atmospheres of the planets to see if they have atmospheres that look like they have been produced by life forms. So for example, the atmosphere you're breathing now is 20% oxygen. And that oxygen was put there by life forms. If the Earth did not have any life, it would not have oxygen. But I didn't want to get caught up on that. I just wanted to start out with this slide here. Can I share the screen now? And now, can you see the slide there? Yes. All right, so this is a picture. If you hold your pinky up in front of your face and as far as you can and look at the size of your pinky, the fingernail on your pinky, that is the size of this image on the sky. It's a very, very tiny, tiny fraction of the sky, but it's a very deep image. And you can see all of those blurbs and blobs are galaxies that are outside of our galaxy, except for a couple of stars. There's a a star right there, that's one star, and there's another star somewhere here. It was like, I'm looking for another star and I can't find another star. <laughs> so anyway, all these other blobs are galaxies, and that means they're made out of uh, hundreds of billions of stars. Now, I should point out that your great-grandparents did not know how big the universe was, and we think we know how big the universe is now, and the answer seems to be infinite. And uh, we know that, <laughs> we think we know that because of something called the microwave background radiation. Now, that's something I did in my PhD. Let me back up. Uh, I'm in Australia. I studied history and English and physics. I lived in Germany and France and Japan and Nigeria and Egypt. And uh, I did my PhD at Berkeley. And while I was there, I studied something called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now, most astronomers are studying these things, these blobs that you're seeing here. But in about 1920 or 1930, astronomers found out that those blobs were not little clouds inside of our galaxy, but were rather separate galaxies. And when they did that, we found out that the universe was much, much, much bigger than we thought it was. Um, and so what I did for my PhD was, we looked beyond all of these galaxies. Now, if you look at the, at the moon, the light that comes from the moon takes about a second. If you look at the sun, the light that comes from the sun takes about eight minutes and 20 seconds. If you look at the nearest star, if you're in this, lucky enough to live in the Southern Hemisphere, you can see the closest stars to the sun, and that's Alpha Centauri. And that's the light from that star takes about four light years. And if you look at Andromeda, that's the nearest galaxy, it takes two million years to the, the light to go from Andromeda to us. And therefore, the light that comes from Andromeda started out before there were humans on this planet. But now it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and people evolve and we evolve and now we're here and then whoop, we look at the light. Uh, but a telescope is a time machine in a very real sense. So the further you look away, the further into the past you are seeing. 
Now, what I did for my PhD at Berkeley was we looked further than anybody else had ever seen. We looked at this image, the full sky, and we looked at the Big Bang. And the Big Bang that we saw was this. This is a map of the full sky that we made. The horizontal red band here is the galaxy, our galaxy, and that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in the hot spots and the cool spots, and the hot spots and the cool spots. And these are what we call fluctuations in the microwave background radiation. These are the oldest photons, oldest light you can see as an astronomer. And we are very proud of making this image. And now there's a whole field called uh, cosmology using cosmic microwave background. So I guess the, the concept that you should try to keep in your head is the further you look away, the further into the past you are seeing. Um, and matter of fact, when you look at your mother or your brother right now, you're looking about a couple of nanoseconds into the past. You're not seeing them as they are now. You're seeing them as they were when the light reflected off their face and came to you. And that takes a finite time. So there, I want to talk about size. Now there are some... Do you want me to interrupt you and ask ahead, a couple go. of questions that we go. got? We got questions about infinity, as you can guess. So first question, what is infinity and will we ever be able to grasp it? If not, why we will never? And what prevents us from perceiving infinity? What prevents us from? Perceiving infinity. Re receiving it. Okay, perceiving, so in, uh, P-E-R-C. Perceiving it. So yes. that, I guess that would mean understanding it. First of all, in infinity is a really weird thing because it's not really a number. Because if you, because for example, one plus infinity is infinity. Infinity squared is infinity. Infinity plus infinity is infinity. Infinity divided by uh, 10 is infinity. Infinity divided by a billion. Anyway, it's a concept. It's, it's almost like the horizon. When you look at a picture or you look at the a horizon, you see it and you say, okay, that's, that, that's infinity. But the, you try to get there and try to get there. You never get there. Uh, Woody Allen made a joke because said that the eternity is really boring, especially near the end. And the reason why that's a joke is because there is no end. When you get, you cannot get closer to infinity by any process of approaching it. On the other hand, there are other things. There's a guy named Cantor in, about eight, in the 19th century uh, who studied infinity. And he also went crazy studying infinity. And uh, he, he determined that there were, at least, there were many, many kinds of infinity. But just to give you an example, there are countable infinities and uncountable infinities. So for example, when, when you have a rational number, one half, two thirds, one tenth, one billion, if you take a number line between zero and one, there are an infinite number of rational numbers between zero and one, an infinite number. But you consider the real numbers, that's like the square root of two, the rationals plus the irrationals, there's an even larger uncountable infinity between zero and one. And you ask yourself the following question, if I take an infinitely sharp knife and I put it right on some precise number, you say, what's the probability of getting a rational number? And the answer to that question is zero because there are so many more um, uncountably infinite real numbers. So I'm not sure if you guys have learned the distinction between rational numbers and real numbers, but if you do, it's an, there's an interesting distinction can be made because one is countably infinite. That means you can count it one, two, three, four, and then you can count them and keep on going, keep on going. But the, era, the uh, real numbers, you cannot even count them. They're just too many to count. And so what does this have to do with? Well, when I talked about the universe and I said it was infinite, I meant spatially infinite. And that means that the universe, we could, the universe could have been shaped like a ball, like the surface of the earth. And that is finite, right? The surface of the earth is finite. Or it could have been shaped like a saddle, or it could have been shaped like a table, flat. And we have found that the universe is flat like a table. And that means it goes on forever. And we are in one position and we can see 
the observable universe around us, but we cannot see any further only because the universe has a finite age, because light travels at a finite speed. We have a fine, we've discovered, for example, the picture that you're looking at is the microwave background. And we used this picture to tell that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. That's not an infinite number of years old. It's a finite number. It's 13.8. And if any of you want to get a Nobel Prize in physics, you should find something that's older than 13.8 billion years. My, my father doesn't believe that time can have a beginning. He says that's too crazy an idea. Time just has to go on and on and on infinitely into the past and infinitely into the future. But with this picture and cosmology, we found that the universe does have a beginning. That means time has a beginning. And that's a crazy idea. It's just hard to get your head around, uh, especially if you're my father. But we have time has a beginning. <laughs> and... Um, so that, what that means is that when the, there's a big bang, we can look back at and we cannot see any further. You could say, well, why can't we see beyond this map? Well, it's the same reason you cannot see into the sun. When you look at the sun, you're only seeing the surface of the sun because it's so hot beyond the surface that the electrons, are, well, the atoms have been ionized and you cannot see through a plasma of electrons. The same thing with this map. We are seeing the photosphere of the universe. When the universe was so hot, you could not see any further into it. And uh, that's what we're looking at here, the photosphere of the universe, just like the photosphere of the sun. I should point out that this is a full sky map. You take this map and wrap it around your head, and everywhere you look, you will see this cosmic microwave background. The question was about infinity. How can we understand infinity? Understanding the shape of the universe tells us that the universe it looks like it is spatially infinite. And if it's spatially infinite, that means that Kai Mine Jima Li, who's looking there with black hair, that means there is an infinite number of Kai Mine Jima Li's in the universe. If the probability of Kai Mine, Mine is more than zero, then there are an infinite number of you. And the same for Dina B. If yeah, hi, Dina. <laughs> so if the probability of Dina B existing is not zero, in an infinite universe, there will be an infinite number of Dina Bs in the universe. Now, notice there's a caveat there. I said, if the probability is not zero, if the probability is zero, then maybe Dina B is the only one in the entire universe, even if the universe is infinite. Now, did that answer any questions? <laughs> I think you raised more questions though. <laughs> so people ask, uh, is our universe expanding? And if it is, what it is expanding into? Okay, now it is expanding and we found this out in about 1930. Um, and so the, yes, the universe is expanding. And in general relativity, you do not need to, when you expand, you, it's not like a balloon in space. Well, uh, you do not, <laughs> let's just say that general relativity says you do not need something to expand into. You can just expand. Let me be more specific about that. Everything you know about, let's say the, your head or my fist here or my nose or this room or the earth or the galaxy, everything you know about has a center, right? It has a center. Like you just put your fist in front of you, that fist has a center. If you pretend that that's the galaxy, the galaxy here, the galaxy has a center. But the universe does not have a center. Now, why would that be? Well, if you, <laughs> uh, if it had a center, <clears throat> some people get think that the expansion of the universe is like a bomb and that it has a center to it and then it blew up. And if that were the case, we astronomers could point and say, you know what, right over there is the center of the universe. But no astronomer can ever do that because there is no center to the universe. Um, now, one way to understand that is just to say it to yourself over and over again, there is no center to the universe. That's a very unsatisfactory way to do that. Another way is to study general relativity and see that, ah, the mathematics of general relativity, the way it describes the universe, it does not need space on the outside in order to expand into. 
Another metaphor would be consider an infinite trampoline. You know what a trampoline is? You go boing, boing, boing. Now, consider that to be space. We're going to make space two-dimensional, and we're going to make that space uh, infinite, the infinite trampoline. And then we take that, we draw a circle on the infinite trampoline, and we say that's our observable universe. And then we stretch the, the observable universe. We stretch the trampoline so that our observable universe here gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But any observable over here, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And over here, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Every circle on that trampoline gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the universe, as the trampoline expands. And it doesn't need space outside of the trampoline to expand into. It might be another way to think about this is if you take infinity and you expand it by a factor of two, you still have infinity. Um, Adrian says, time cannot exist without matter. Matter cannot exist without space. Space cannot exist without time. So they all had to start at the same point. Is that right? Uh, maybe, maybe that's right. That sounds a lot right, but let's consider the end of the universe. Right now, the stars are shining, but the stars are burning hydrogen into helium and then they'll burn helium into other things, but they will not shine forever. The sun, for example, that's shining right here will shine for another four or five billion years. We know that because we know how big it is, we know how much hydrogen it has and how fast it's burning that hydrogen. Stars do not shine forever. And in about 10 to the 100 years from now, there will be no stars because all the hydrogen will have been burned up and the universe will start to get into equilibrium. There'll be no life forms and there'll be no stars shining. There'll be no sources of energy. And so it essentially it just slows down, slows down, slows down. It's, it's sometimes called the heat death. It should be called the cool death, not the heat death, but the name we give for this end of the universe is called the heat death. But it really means everything slows down and then nothing happens. And you could ask the question, well, after, after things slow down, uh, what, does that mean that time no longer goes on? You cannot have a clock to measure things, but every, things are still vibrating a little bit. They're not at absolute zero. They're not at the a zero Kelvin. They're vibrating a little bit, but we cannot make clocks out of them anymore. So uh, whether time goes by if you don't have a clock is kind of asking the question, do trees make noise in the forest when they fall if nobody's listening? That's a, an old chestnut that uh, I guess I would answer kind of, yeah, they make noise, but not noise that can be heard. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the, the, the beginning of time is something that's hard to think about. Another way to think about it is the following. In, as you get closer to the Big Bang, you get, well, in high school, you will learn that here's space and here's time. I got to draw a diagram, here's space and here's time. But in general relativity, these things get bent and they get bent and the closer you get to the Big Bang, the they get become like this. So there is no line that you can think of. It's a squiggly line that gets squigglier and squigglier. And as you get closer to the Big Bang, it gets so squiggly that you have space-time foam. And uh, that is, uh, something that it's very hard to, to figure. Where's the beginning of time if it's all spaghetti like that? Is there any, are there any other questions? <laughs> there are lots of questions, but we may continue on and then we'll stop again okay. for another all right. set of so this questions. Is, so I showed you this picture of galaxies and then the universe got really big and then we looked at these, the oldest photons we can see. And then we looked at this little pretty little girl uh, in the hands of, I think of Buddha. And here's another alien who's holding another a human being. And here in 1835, we did not know whether the moon was inhabited. And there was a scientific hoax uh, that was published in all the newspapers at the time saying, this is what the inhabitants of the moon looks like. And so it looks like the flying monkeys in the Wizard of Oz. And I think if you look down here, you can see a looks like a unicorn, a whole family of unicorns and their birds and their fl anyway, flying people essentially. So, but that was a hoax that uh, you cannot, <laughs> this does not exist on the, on the moon. Um, they had pools of water here. 
But now here's something, I don't know why I like this picture. It was just uh, when I was young, I was very confused about everything. So I just thought I'd put that in there. If you're confused about this, that's probably a good thing because in order to learn something, you often have to unlearn all the things you think you know about something. I, I teach at the university level and I spend a lot of time having to unlearn teaching the students to not think that they know things that they think they know <laughs> in order to make progress. Um, anyway, so here are some interesting cartoons. Here's on the left here, we have a, an alien looking through a microscope at some human beings. And on the right, we have two uh, gentlemen looking at an alien with a giant brain. Aliens have giant brains because we think that our brains are the best thing that ever happened to the universe. And so every life form on other planets will also have a giant brain. Um, I've written a couple of articles about why that's a crazy idea. Uh, one thing is that uh, I call it the planet of the apes fallacy. The idea is that if we have World War Three or four and we kill all the people on earth, what will happen? Will chimpanzees evolve into this intelligence niche that we think we operate? And I would say that no, chimpanzees are not trying to evolve into humans any more than humans are trying to evolve into chimpanzees. Species do not try to evolve, evolve into each other. In any case, I think that our notions about intelligent aliens with these giant brains are kind of silly and produced by Hollywood, but they do speak to our vanity, I think. Oh, so here's the munchkins in The Wizard of Oz. So here's an example of almost alien people in The Wizard of Oz. And there's Dorothy on the right. And here's an ant. I just wanted to talk about uh, small things that you can see outside, the life forms. If you want to talk about the sizes of life forms elsewhere in the universe, one thing you should do is try to figure out how big is the range of sizes of the life forms on Earth first. So here's an ant, and you can see here's an ant eye. And I'm going to show you a movie in which it uses an, an electron microscope to zoom in on an ant's eye. That's in this next slide. So we're going to take this ant and embed it in some uh, uh, metal. And so here's the head of the ant. Here's an eyeball. Here's the antenna. Now the ants use the antennas to, uh, to feel the universe and feel the smell things. But we're going to zoom in on this picture here, on this eyeball here. These are called uh, omatidia. And uh, okay, here goes the movie. It's going to go slow at first, but we're going to zoom in more and more so you can get a feeling for how small the structures of life forms are. So here goes the movie. We're zooming in on the eye of an ant. And now we can go past the antenna and going into the eye. And we can see the hexagons there. It's kind of like the, the hexagons of a beehive almost. But now we're getting closer and closer. On the left there, over here is a piece of pollen, a pollen grain. And the, now we're getting closer and closer to one of these hexagons. And then I'm not sure what this stuff is. I think that might be bacteria of some kind or maybe an amoeba. And now we start to lose resolution because I don't know how to make an electron microscope work very well. <laughs> and so it all just becomes blurry. But there's still structure even at this scale. And so I will, so that's a zoom in on a very uh, small structure already. It's an ant. So, so we have a question. Here we have on the left, we have the whole earth. And some people think that the whole earth is alive and they call it a biosphere and they give it the name Gaia. And then on the right, we have something called a prion. And that's a, you can see it's a protein that causes other proteins to shape, become like this shape. And uh, that's, you could call that a life form or not. But in any case, I guess I wanted to make the, the, the point that life is something that maybe disappears or becomes unlike life on the largest scales and unlike life at the smallest scales. But what do we mean by life? I, no one has come up with a good definition of it. And so we use the word life all the time, but I don't think we know what we're talking about. Anyway, if you, uh, let me get this out of the way here. If you're looking for something, like this chimpanzee looking for termites, if you're looking for something, um, oops, if you're looking for something, it's useful to know how big that something is. And we're looking for life elsewhere in the universe. How small can life be and still be life? And how big can life be and still be life? 
I don't know if these are questions you've thought of before, but this is something that we think of as astrobiologists looking for life elsewhere in the universe. Now, Julia, are there any questions about that? Or should I go? Uh, I can't hear you. Because I forgot to unmute myself. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> what if you ask them what they think about it? Well, here's some questions. So, you know, you probably think you're a life form, but do you think that the, well, obviously I think the bacteria in your mouth is a life form, but how about the little organelles in your cells called mitochondria? Are they life forms? When you have life forms living inside of you, are they life forms? Or is the city, you probably live in a city or a town, is the town alive? Could you call the, a, the town a life form? Or could you call a forest? You walk into the forest, is that a life form or do you have to divide it up into trees? Some trees are connected to each other by roots. And uh, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, the largest life form is a tree and 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 they're all connected. They all have the same genes and their roots are all connected. So it's, it's not obvious what a life form is. Uh, some of my colleagues think uh, that stars are alive. Others think that the galaxies are alive. And other think that the, the uh, I don't know, maybe the whole universe is alive. And so it really depends on what you mean by alive. And I tell you right now, we are not sure what that word means. So does anybody, do you think you know what life, does anybody think they know what life forms are? So try, try to come up with your definition I, I will, I will of keep life. Going. Well, no, you know what? I would, I, would, I would discourage you from trying to come up with a definition of life because people do it and they think it's useful, but it's like trying to come up with a definition of a human being. And there's a very famous philosopher named Nietzsche who said, anything that has evolved cannot be defined. Now, if you're a mathematician, you can define pi, 3.14, blah, 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 blah. But pi did not evolve. But if you're a human being, you, come, you have evolved. Our species has evolved. But if you go back in time, go back further and further and further, if whatever definition you have, that definition will get undone as you go further and further into the past. And it won't get undone at some threshold. It'll get undone slowly and slowly and slowly and slowly. For example, think of an eyeball. You see these eyeballs here? Everybody's looking at me with eyeballs. Now say, how you can define an eyeball, right? Well, you, let's pretend we have a time machine and we go into our time machine and we go back 200 million years and talk, we look at our ancestors and we can say, did they have eyeballs? And they say, yes, they did. We have a common ancestor with, uh, with monotremes, echidnas about 200 million years ago. And let's go back another 200 million years ago. And then we have, uh, ancestors that are more like little, uh, little larvae. They're, they're kind of proto-vertebrates. And then go back in our time machine another uh, 200 million years. And the problem is that the eyeball kind of get, turns into a photosensitive pigment, which turns into just some chemistry that changes with light. And then it just turns into nothing that we would call an eyeball. So the point is that in evolution, when something evolves, you cannot define it in a way that is valid for all time because it evolved. It kind of appeared, it, it, it emerged out of non-eyeballness. And the same thing is true for life. We think that life emerged out of non-life. And if that's the case, then any definition will, of life today will be invalid as we get into our time machine and go back earlier and earlier. So people say that whatever definition we will come up with is limiting us. So, Well, I, I would say that you shouldn't try to define things that have evolved. You should try to understand how they have evolved and how they have changed. And by using definitions that prevents you from understanding how things have changed. It's, I guess it's, I'm, uh, I'm uh, making a case here for more fluid, less rigid definitions of things. All right, let me continue. Unless there's another question, Julia. Um, there was a question and a former comment a bit earlier, just a second. 
Um, what if we take a bunch of tardigrades on the foreign planet or moon and come back later? Okay, so you probably heard about tardigrades. They are metazoa, it's a fancy word for their animals, and they can withstand being frozen in ways that uh, other animals have a hard time doing. They're very robust, but I don't like when people who talk about extremophiles talk about tardigrades because bacteria and archaea are much, much more robust than tardigrades. Tardigrades are cute, but whenever I'm trying to understand the origin of life and the extremes of life, I never use tardigrades. I always use bacteria and viruses. So uh, we were talking about definitions. If you go around the world and ask a biology professor, hey, are viruses alive? Just ask, ask if you ask your mother or father, ask, so, ask a biologist. And I've done this. I've gone all around the world asking people, asking biologists, are viruses alive? And my first survey said, half the people said yes, and half the people said no. So that gives you an idea. Now, viruses are the most abundant organisms on Earth. They are more abundant. They're about 10 times more abundant than bacteria. And bacteria are much more abundant than anything that, like a chimpanzee or a person. So the most abundant thing on Earth, we do not know whether it's a life form or not. And, and the, the biologists, the specialists, cannot agree on that. That shows you the degree to which this thing, what is a life form, we do not know. And, and I don't think we should pretend that you can do this because life evolved. Um, no, I forgot. So tardigrade. So, so I don't like it when people take tardigrade and say, oh, look at how cool and interesting and I, different I think tardigrade. the idea was, the question was related to the evolution. How will tardigrades evolve if we take them to another planet? Oh, we have no idea. If you take tardigrades and, or any life form on Earth, let's talk about Mars, for example. Now, they're right around, around the world right now. There are about a dozen laboratories that are creating, they take dirt that's kind of like the dirt on Mars and dirt, and then they put it in a temperature range like on Mars, and they give it an atmosphere like on Mars, and then they try to select, they try to get bacteria or archaea to, or maybe even fungi, to be tolerant of those Martian conditions. And with some success, because Mars is not like Venus, Venus is really bad, but if you, you can create organisms on Earth by simulating Martian environments that can tolerate Martian environments. Now, let's say in 10 years, we go to Mars and we take some of these organisms, and then we leave them there, let's say, and ask the question, what will happen to them? And the answer is, we have no idea. <laughs> I say that because no one has successfully predicted any macroscopic direction for evolution. We really do not know the directions of evolution. A lot of people will say, oh, life evolves to become more complex, but I'm not quite sure. I would argue against that, but most people would, would like that idea. I don't think there's, um, I don't agree with it though. So the, in answer to your question, if you take a life form, put it on a planet, somewhere or on Mars and ask the question, what will happen to it? The answer is we do not know. It could uh, die or it could stay alive. And if it does stay alive, what will it evolve into? Uh, we do not know. Okay. So I, I think we can continue for some more. Okay, so mm -hmm. is there a size range for life? Now here's Gulliver's Travels. And here is uh, Gulliver here, and he's holding a Lilliputian here. That's Gulliver. And here's a Brogdignagian, and, uh, and that's a giant person. So Jonathan Swift in 1726 wrote a book about Gulliver's travels in which he went to Lilliput and saw people like this. And then he went to Brogdignag and he met people like this. And, and here's the king on the, of the Brogdignagians on the right and he is looking with a microscope at Gulliver. Uh, so physical sizes, so let's talk about physical sizes, not about life, but let's just talk only about physics and the sizes 
Now, I hope your students know how to use exponential notation because that's what I'm going to use here. So for example, pebbles like this have a size of about one centimeter, about as big as your thumb, right? And let's just arrange things from big things to small things. And if we have an electron, now this right here is an electron surrounded by iron atoms. And this was done with a scanning tunneling electron microscope at an IBM laboratory. And this is what an electron looks like. And these are what iron atoms look like. That's a 10 to the minus uh, 16 centimeters. And then uh, that is what space-time foam might look like. We don't know exactly what it looks like, but that's an artist's portrayal. So that's as small as we can get and still say we have some idea of what's going on. Any smaller than that, well, I guess it's just space-time foam all the way down. It doesn't have any smaller structures that we know of in physics. But let's go to bigger sizes now. Um, and so there's the solar system. It's 10 to the 16. Now, Julia, when I use the term 10 to the 16, do your students know what that means? Um, they're actually explaining it to each other right now in chat. Those who do ah. know ex are explaining it okay. to those who don't. So just, just, to be, just to be clear, 10 to the zero is one centimeter. 10 to the one is 10 centimeters. 10 to the two centimeters is 100 centimeters. 10 to the three is a thousand centimeters. 10 to the six is a million centimeters. 10 to the nine is a billion centimeters. 10 to the 12th is a trillion centimeters. And the size of the solar system is 10 to the 16 centimeters. And then we have, I showed you this map, the observable universe is 10 to the 33 centimeters. And it might be the case that our universe is part of a multiverse in which case uh, it's a tiny, tiny fraction. And uh, I guess 10 to the infinity is just an infinite number of centimeters. We have no idea, but we, it might be the case that the entire universe is infinite. The observable universe is not infinite. And so it's very important to make that distinction between the observable universe, this part of it you can see, and then even beyond that, what it's embedded in. Any questions about this, uh, I guess the size range from big to small in physics? Any questions there? People are about 10 to the two centimeters. They're somewhere in the middle there. Oh, I, I, I think everybody okay. got this. Uh, oh. When Elizabeth, when you say how big is time? How big is time? Uh -huh. Well, I guess the right answer is how long in time you can ask how long is the pa how can you go infinitely far into the past? And it looks like that's the answer is no, you can only go 13.8 billion years into the past. But into the future, it looks like you can go infinity into the future. So time is something that has a beginning, but no end. Space, it looks like you can go in, you actually notice that this, you can go infinitely large to the multiverse, but on the small scales, I've only gone to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And that is the smallest scale that we can talk about in physics. And, um, yeah, that we, it can't go infinitely small. And you could say, why not? And I would say, look up the Planck sizes. Um, there's a, Planck is this person, the physicist about 120 years ago, who talked about the smallest scales you can talk about in physics. And there's the Planck time, and there's the Planck mass, and there's the Planck uh, size. So the Planck size is how far light can travel in the Planck time. <laughs> and these are all related to each other. And I would, I would encourage you, if you're interested in the smallest, to go look up Planck time. You got a question, if universe is fractal on different scales. Mm -hmm. If it is fractal. 
Is it a fractal on different scales? Well, mm -hmm. well the, the word fractal, whenever I hear the word fractal, I think of the coastline of England and using a different size ruler to measure it. And if you use a ruler that's a kilometer long to measure the coastline of England, you come up with a size, let's say, I don't know, 10,000 kilometers. But if you use a, a, a ruler that's half a kilometer, then the size is not 10,000, the length becomes, let's say 20,000. If you use a ruler that's the size of the Planck scale, then maybe the, the length of the coastline gets to be, I don't know, a thousand or a billion times longer because you keep on going in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out. But as long as, you're, as long as your ruler has a finite length to it, I imagine that the coastline is finite too. Uh, but if you allow your ruler to get infinitely small, then it, the coastline probably goes to infinity. And uh, they use things like that to measure the fractal dimension of something. Uh, but it looks, on the universe, on the largest scale, it doesn't look like it's fractal. It does look like it's homogeneous. And uh, there is not structure uh, on, on scales lo much larger than the size of the observable universe. On the small scale, I don't know what it means to have space-time foam that is fractal. I haven't thought about that. As the universe grows and expands, will we get to see more or less of it as the time goes on? Uh, we see more of it uh, because the age is longer and so life, light can travel further. But there will be a limit to that. Now that we know that there's something called lambda, which is the cosmological constant, which was the, the universe is not only expanding, it's expanding at an accelerating rate. And that was discovered uh, in 1998, 1999. And as a matter of fact, the vice chancellor of the university where I, where I do research, he got the Nobel Prize in 2006 for discovering that the, ex the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And that has implications in cosmology. And one of the implications is that we will see more and more of the universe, but the universe has a, what's called a cosmological horizon. And that is the events that are beyond the horizon we will never see. Uh, it's sometimes said that, uh, that, that event, or rather particles or galaxies fall over the cosmological horizon and you will never see their future. And that, that's true. It's kind of like something falling into a black hole. You will never see that something inside of a black hole. You can only see it on the surface. If there were a mirror more than 13.8 billion years away from us, and we could somehow see the reflection from it, would we see ourselves before the beginning of the universe? How far away is this mirror? 13.8 uh, billion light years away. It's 13.8 billion light years away. Okay, now there's to, before I try to answer that question, there's one interesting fact. The size of the universe is not 13.8 light years. And you can say, well, wait a minute. It's 13.8 billion years old. Light has been traveling for 13.8 billion years. Therefore, the size of the universe must be 13.8 billion light years. And that answer is wrong. And that's because, I'll, I'll give you an example. Suppose that you can run, I don't know, 10, let's just say 10 kilometers an hour. And you run 100 meters. Or no, let's say you can run 100 meters in 10 seconds. And you look back at the track and say, well, how big, how far have you run? You've run 100 meters, of course. But now, at, let's change the situation. Let's say you start running, and as you run, I'm going to expand the track underneath you. And so it's going to expand and expand. And as you run, it expands and expands. And by the time you get to the end, you will have run 100 meters, but the size of the track behind you is 200 meters. So you could say you've run 200 meters because that's the size across which you have run, but you've only been running at a certain speed for a certain time. And you say, well, I only ran 100 meters. But you look back and say, oh, the universe is 200 meters long. So you've traveled 
longer than 100 meters, but that's only because the distance you have traveled has expanded behind you. So, so when you say, <laughs> so let's pretend that the universe is not expanding so we can get away from that complication. And we put a mirror at 13.8 billion light years away. And we, if we put it there, you cannot see your reflection because uh, you, for light to hit, go from you to the mirror and then back, it would take 27.6, isn't that right? 27.6 billion years to do that. And that's not how old the universe is. Is the quest person who asked that question satisfied with that answer? Really? Or do you want to modify your question a little bit, Quinn? Put the mirror elsewhere? <laughs> well, one, one thing that is interesting is that the Big Bang, you can say, where did the Big Bang happen? And the Big Bang happened everywhere. It happened in every room that you're in right now. It happened in Australia, it happened in America, it happened in Europe, it happened every, everywhere in the galaxy, everywhere in the universe. So there's no center to the universe. But anyway, I will keep on going unless I hear, <coughs> unless I'm interrupted here. So let's talk about biological sizes. Now there's a multicellular organism, a fly, that's about a centimeter. And there's a, these are two bacteria, a unicellular organisms, and these are E. coli bacteria, and there's a little line in between them, and that line is covered with viruses. So those are viruses right there, and these bacteria are trying to exchange DNA, and the viruses are trying to get inside of the tunnel that has been created to enable that exchange. And then we have something called a viroid. If you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a very interesting type of virus that lives by itself, and they were discovered Oh, maybe a few decades ago. And then uh, there are viruses there. See, the viroid is right here. Viruses are much, much bigger than that. They have many more DNA molecules or RNA. So then there's genes and then there's prions. And at the larger scale, you can talk about ecosystems or Gaia, and maybe even larger if you want to talk about stars being alive. But in any case, that's a range of sizes from Gaia down to prions. The Earth is 10 to the 9 centimeters, and prions are 10 to the minus 6. So life, as usually understood, disappears as we go to either end of this size range. And that's kind of interesting that we have a concept of life that depends on size. There's 15 orders of magnitude. Humans at 10 to the 2 centimeters are in the middle. And in the size range of what we could recognize as life, we are in the middle. And how objective can that be? In other words, I'm accusing us of being very subjective about what we define as to be life. So if we take physical sizes without biology and add biology to them, there are your 15 orders of magnitude. And you can see that's much less than the 66 orders of magnitude uh, from small to big in physics. So another question that I, I when I take a survey, I, 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 I go around the world asking people a question. If I gave you $100 billion with the caveat that you had to spend it to help, to help answer the question, are we alone? Would you spend any of it looking for nano aliens? And uh, the answer, it seems to be no. I would not spend any of this $100 billion. Most people would buy telescopes, but they would not get microscopes and try to look for aliens. You actually got a question here just a second ago. What okay. if bacteria are intelligent and they think that humans are the universe or something like red blood cells, like individual humans? Right, right. This is a question I've asked people. I said, um, imagine, you know, you have about a hundred billion neurons in your, in your brain. And Imagine if you were a neuron. Now, these neurons do not know that they are part of a brain, right? They just do not know that they are part of a brain. So could it be the case that humans and maybe the life forms on Earth are 
part of a much, much larger organism or alien. For example, if you say that the, the galaxy is alive, well, we certainly are part of the galaxy, and so are all the other life forms that might be on planets that are in the galaxy. So, you know, if you look at your hand right now, in your cells in your hand, there are things called mitochondria. Those mitochondria used to be free living things, and about two billion years ago, they were incorporated into an amoeba, which then turned into a multicellular organism. So right now, matter of fact, you're breathing oxygen. The reason you can use oxygen is because of the mitochondria inside all of your cells. But the mitochondria, are, are they life forms or are they a part of a life form? Well, that's where these definitions start to break down and your question becomes meaningless because the answer is yes and yes. Are they part of a life form? Yes. Are they a life form? Yes. Um, so, but when you ask the question, could we be part of a life form? It really depends on whether you think, for example, Gaia, I, I showed you a picture of the whole earth. If the whole earth is alive, then yes, definitely we are part of a life form. On the other hand, if you just say, hey, the city of Canberra where I live is a, is a life form, then yes, of course, I'm a part of that life form too. So it's very difficult to, uh, to use reductionism to try to think about some of these ideas. And I think if you can minimize reductionism and try to think of yourself as part of larger things, then uh, maybe that's what we need to understand. Maybe we are part of an alien and we don't even know it. You know, it's kind of... Hey asked a question, what if we are the neurons of an alien and the space is the body of an alien? So yes. Yes, uh, that's, I, want to, I, I think you should take that image seriously and it will help you undermine and unlearn many of the things you take for granted. <laughs> we don't know. Now, you could ask, how could you test that idea? And the only way I think you can test that idea of whether we are inside of an alien is to do what they did in The Truman Show. You know the movie The Truman Show? The guy was part of an experiment. He, did, he didn't know he was in an experiment. He was in a kind of an artificial environment. And how do you know whether you are in such an environment? The same question can be asked if, are we part of a simulation? Has some alien developed a simulation and we are living inside that simulation? Well, how would you know? And in the, in the movie, The Matrix, they looked for glitches. They said, oh, there's a glitch, therefore I'm in a simulation. But, uh, I'm not sure how you would do that. And if you can't think of a way to test it, well, maybe that question doesn't matter. That's kind of a weird thing to say, but um, if you're inside of a simulation and you can't tell that it's a simulation, well, in some real sense, then you are not in a simulation because you associate the word simulation with something that's been fabricated and is less real than reality. And uh, you'd have to call into question those assumptions. Um, Adrian asks, how would you define a glitch? How would you define a glitch? Well, uh, the closest thing to a glitch that I can think of in real physics is the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. And that is, there are pairs of things you can observe. For example, the, so the uh, position of something, and let's say the velocity of something. And if you measure the position really, really accurately, then you cannot measure the velocity accurately. The velocity of something just becomes unknown. Similarly, if you measure the velocity of something really precisely, then the position becomes unknown. So it's kind of like when you do a simulation, you have a time resolution. You have a size element or a time element that is the minimum amount of time between time steps in your simulation. And if that's a finite number and you want a better simulation, usually you make the time step smaller and the pixels smaller. But if there, the universe seems to have a limitation, coupled limitations between position and velocity and between time and energy that uh, may be the pixelization of the uh, universe we're living in, and maybe that's an example 
of, well, they only had a finite amount of computing power when they were putting together this simulation, and so we'll be able to see it. But that's about as close as I can come to trying to figure out whether we are or are not living in a simulation. Another piece of interesting info about this is, you know, when you look, you can look around at the room right now and ask yourself, where is my blind spot? We know that each of your eyes has a part of its retina where the cell, the nerve cells, the nerve cables go through the back of your retina and create a blind spot in your vision. But your brain fills in that blind spot the best it can with the information of the surrounding visual field. And so you do not see the blind spot, but it's really there. So in some sense, your brain is lying to you, but it's also helping you at the same time. It's lying by filling in the blind spot with information, but it's making a pretty good guess usually of what is in that blind spot. But you cannot see the blind spot. And so, I don't know, it's kind of like your brain is creating its own simulation for you to, <laughs> to digest and consume, but it's uh, manufactured. Julia, are you there? Yes, yes, yes. Should I continue? Yes. Okay, so $100 billion for, to find nano aliens. Most people say, no, nano aliens are crazy. But there's a very famous physicist named Richard Feynman. Uh, here's a picture of him in 1959. And he said, there's plenty of room at the bottom. What he meant by that is we humans are building things and we can build things smaller and smaller and smaller. It should be possible in principle to make nanoscale machines. And, the, and for example, here's a, the world's smallest Starship Enterprise. So that's the Starship on the bottom left there. And uh, it's uh, nine micromillimeter, micrometers. That's about one tenth the size of the width of a human hair. And then we have something called the Fermi's Paradox. And Fermi's Paradox is the question, where is everybody? We have all these scientists like myself and others who are looking for aliens elsewhere, but they should have been here by now. If, if intelligence is, a, is something we should expect of life elsewhere, then we know that the galaxy is about 10 billion years old, and it only takes about a million years to go from one side of the galaxy to the other, if you're traveling at one-tenth the speed of light. And so there would be met lots and lots of time for alien civilizations to have colonized the entire galaxy, but we don't see them. And this is known as Fermi's paradox. Where is everybody? They should, aliens should have colonized the galaxy by now, but we don't see them. Um, maybe the aliens are really small and they're around us. Now, other possibilities include, there's a book here, Life Beyond Earth, and they thought that instead of atomic chemistry, like the chemistry that's going on in your head right now to understand what I'm saying, maybe there's life on the surface of a neutron star would be based on nuclear chemistry. And just to give you an idea of what that meant, if, if this green cricket oval is the size of, a, of a, an atom, well, the size of the nucleus is right about the size of that red, those red, the three red people there in the middle. So nuclear chemistry is very, very much different and very much smaller scale and very much more energetic than atomic chemistry. But you can imagine that you could use nuclear chemistry as the basis of life instead of atomic chemistry. So in a book that discusses this possibility, there are intelligent creatures the size of a sesame seed who live and think and develop a million times faster than humans. So you have civilizations rising and falling on timescales of like a second or so on the surface of a neutron star. And so here's Haldane. Uh, he's a famous biologist who said, the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. And if that's the case, then I can encourage you to think big and use your imaginations to undo some of the inflexible definitions that you've learned and been taught. And if you can do that successfully, and at the same time understand how life came to be without trying to define it too rigidly, then I think you can get closer to what the universe is really like 
and often that is queerer than we can suppose. <laughs> and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. We are getting lots of questions actually here. So okay. well, then I will so stop sharing. For, so what? So we'll ask a question then. So let's see what we have there. Just a second. Let me. Aha. Uh -huh. What if they exist, but they just aren't here because they're not smart or the Jonathan, I would ask you to restate it a little bit because I'm not sure when you say they, what you want to say. So I'll, I'll just read the Queens for now. If we're suggesting that perhaps aliens are there, but we're just not looking at things the right way, that then we are putting life in the fixed box that limits our understanding of what it is, could we perhaps be doing the same thing with the universe? In other words, how can we be so certain that the universe itself is 13.8 billion years old and not older than that? Is it just another box we are creating through the limits of our observation? Well, uh, when you say creating another box, we have tried to figure out how big the universe is and we the best model we have to describe cosmology is called general relativity and so we use general relativity that's the context the scientific context in which we come to conclusions like the universe is 13.8 billion years old we also have observations of called the doppler the red shifting of galaxies so we look at a galaxy and we see that from its light it has been red shifted and that is equivalent to moving away. And so the, the data we have that says that, the, that says the universe is expanding is uh, pretty good. And there are many, there are many different ways that, that support, there are many observations that support the idea that the universe is expanding. And so the logic is the following. Well, if it's expanding, in the, if it's this big today, well, yesterday it was this big. A billion years ago, it was this big. A billion years before that, it was this big. When, and so what we're doing is turning time backwards. And when you have an expanding universe that you go backwards, it gets smaller and smaller. But then there's a point in the past when everything is on top of everything else. And that's uh, this 13.8 billion year old, that, or Big Bang that happened about 13.8 billion years ago. Now I should say that this, what I've just described is that observations, based on observations, but as you get closer and closer to the Big Bang, we do, not, we do not have any information. So for example, I showed you that map of the red and blue. That's, a, that's the image of the universe when it's already 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Now, if we wanna look earlier, we can't see earlier than that with photons because the universe was too hot. And that's what's called a redshift of about a thousand or so. But if we had neutrino telescopes and we're developing neutrino telescopes, we can see further into, we can see through that fog. It's like being able to see into the photosphere of the sun a little bit, and that will help us get closer to the Big Bang. And if we can use gravitational waves, then we can see even further. Then we can see right back to what's called the Planck time, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And you can ask the question, well, wait a minute, why not zero seconds? I, I would suggest that, uh, when you assume that time goes on forever into the past, you are using a, uh, I guess it's a common sense that doesn't make sense in physics. One of the reasons I study physics is because it kind of jostles, it really shakes the foundation of what I think is true. For example, if, you, if there are any twins in your audience, and if you take one of those twins and send them to Alpha Centauri very fast and then have them come back, the twin that stayed on Earth could have aged, let's say, 50 years, and the twin that comes back could have, well, actually not 50 years, but let's say the twin that stays on Earth is like 10 years older. The twin that comes back will only be a year older. And so the one of the twins has become much older than the other. And if you move, watch the movie Interstellar, you can see a daughter that gets older than her father. Now that sounds weird, but it is what special relativity 
and general relativity suggest about the universe. This has been tested many times, and it sounds like the weirdest thing you've ever, but it's true. It, it's true in the sense that general relativity and special relativity are true. I should point out that we know that at the at closer and closer to the Big Bang we get, general relativity has to break down because it needs quantum mechanics. You have to have quantum cosmology, and we do not have a way of combining quantum mechanics with general relativity yet. And many, many people are trying, but that's what we need if we want to discuss even further closer to the Big Bang. And uh, we haven't gotten there yet, and I'm hoping somebody who's really, really smart can combine quantum mechanics and general relativity and then enable us to model what happened as we get closer and closer to the Big Bang, but also what happens inside of a black hole. The same problem exists. We need, quanti we need to quantize general relativity. So you got a, a question from Elon who asked if there could be microscopic aliens living inside our nose. You, why not? <laughs> why not? You need to test this. Now, there are, what I did, I call these things nano aliens. First of all, you have viruses in there. Your nose is filled with viruses. So you, when you use the word aliens, you assume that they are alive. But as I told you earlier, half of the world's biologists think that viruses are not alive and half of them think they are alive. So let's ask the question, are, are these viruses aliens? Well, half the people think they're alive, half the people think they don't. <laughs> but anyway, if you get a re what you need to do is get really, really good microscope. And I have asked people about this question. I say, what do you do when you take a picture of something and you don't know what it is? And I wanted to get all these pictures of unidentified nano somethings and try to see if we're, there's any pattern to it or maybe discover nano aliens. But what they do when they have something that they don't know what it is, they throw it away. So they do not investigate further because that's not what they're trying. They're not trying to look for nano aliens with these microscopes. They're trying to develop quantum computation and they need atomic level resolution in order to control where the atoms are in their silicon chips. Uh, and so they're not interested in the question of nano aliens. Um, so uh, we don't know, it's an interesting idea. You know, it's kind of like uh, Christopher Columbus had an interesting idea when he decided to sail west uh, to, to find India. And he died thinking that he had found India. <laughs> Circling back uh, to the original question, are we living inside of an alien? Well, again, you have to ask yourself, what do you mean by an alien? And if, if uh, the Earth is, an, is a life form, then in some sense it's an alien life form because it's different and alien to what we normally call life. And we definitely are part of the Earth. So, yes. But notice how it depends very strongly on your assumptions about whether you want to consider the Earth as a life form or not, or whether you want to consider the galaxy as a life form or not. And that depends on how you define life. But then I said earlier, you shouldn't try to define life. So these are really questions that are open that uh, should allow lots of room for thought since you have young people around you. They can think about crazy things and imaginations. But as you get to become a, a more of a senior scientist, you need to make observations and figure out. When you have an idea, you need to have it tested. So you say, OK. Let's test the idea. Are we part of an alien? Well, we're definitely part of the Earth. So how do you test whether the Earth is an alien or a life form or not? And that's what you need to figure out. OK, well, thank you so much. Um, I guess it's about time to wrap it up. Yes, we planned for an hour. We Ran over the time a little bit. So, any last minute questions before we um, leave? Someone is accusing uh, an alien, and I, I would say I am no more of an alien than you are. <laughs> well, <laughs> again, it depends what you mean by alien, doesn't it? 
Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, do you have any questions to the kids that you wanted to ask them before we Well, I, I kind of, uh, do I have any questions for the kids? Well, I just hope that they can think about this question and uh, keep an open mind about the words that they're using uh, and not pretend that they know what they're talking about <laughs> when they're using words like alien or like infinity or life or viruses or a lot of the words that you use are, uh, we pretend that we know what we're talking about and we, we uh, don't. And so I hope that that message has gotten across and that I think it'll help them think about science in the future. Thank you so much. Okay, Th that was great. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank Thanks, you. Julia. So bye. Good night, everyone.